Hey everyone, um, as Rob said, um, this is NCS um, monthly webinar. Um, right, monthly webinar. Back up. Um, and it's hosted by the Supercomputer for Supercomputing for Everyone series at Indiana University. Um, I wanted to say, remind you of a couple of things. Um, so you see here, um, NC Gas and ways to connect with NC Gas. Um, we have a website um, with all sorts of information about how to sign up, et cetera, and a very um, active blog. So I think you'll find a lot of things in their blog, um, both on bioinformatics and on HBC um, that you might find interesting. We do a Discord um, live help desk. Um, two weeks after this talk. So two weeks from now at two, um, we will be sitting there on Discord, um, ready and willing to ask questions. At the moment, we don't get a lot of traffic, so you'll get a lot of pretty personalized attention. And if you can't find, it, it's not on our website yet. So if you can't find it, um, talk to us. Um, Hey Tom, it's PTI, on the website basic... at the very bottom. We just added it today. It? It's at the, at the very bottom of the website. So. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, NC Gas is a center in the Pervasive Technology Institute. So that's their website in the middle there. Um, we have help email, um, which goes directly to a ticketing system so we can keep track of them all. And, um, and then we're pretty active on Twitter. So um, if you're a Twitter fan, um, start following us and let us know and we'll start following you. Okay, then let's see. Before I introduce Lydia, um, Layla Freeborn, who's actually an NC Gas um, staff member, scientist, um, will present next month. Um, red frog, green frog, blue frog, estimating phylogenetic relationships among closely related populations of Omphaga pomulio from Bocas de Del, um, Panama. So these are um, arrow frogs or, or painted frogs, or whatever you call them. So cute little boogers um, with a lot of color variation, which is what her interests were. Today, um, Lydia is going to tell us about. Um, the molecular determinants of philosopher reduction in paramecium cells. Um, Lydia did her PhD at the University of Chicago um, in cell and molecular biology, studying um, Rab GPases um, in the ciliate tetrahymena, Rab's um, orchestrated vesicle movement. Um, from her postdoc, um, for her percent, she moved to Mike Lynch's lab at Indiana University and another ciliate, paramecium tetrahyma, which she still studies. Um, and she's now at the State University of New York um, at the Falls as an assistant professor, um, still studying paramecium, especially uh, infection and evolutionary cell biology. Um, this is just credits. Um, we're affiliated with Indiana University, the Crazy Technology Institute. Um, within IU, we're a management unit of the Research Technologies Division of. University Information Technology Services. Um, and really important, this um, project, NC Gas and, and this grant um, through NSF, um, are a collaboration between IU and the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So um, we work with them quite a lot. We use some of their uh, computer infrastructure. And without, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Lydia. All right, let me just share my screen. All right, Careful. you can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, um, thank you for the kind introduction, Tom, and thanks for having me. And, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk, as Tom said, I'm going to talk about um, finding molecular determinants of holospora infection in paramecium cells and the two kind of halves of this project that we've been doing over the last few years. 
Um, so just some background on paramecia. So paramecia are single-celled organisms. They're ciliates. Um, they are large and voracious bacterivores. So you guys can see my pointer, right? Yes, here, no? Yes, we can. Yay. Yeah. Okay, so um, here's a paramecium cell. They are large for microscopic organisms. Um, they're about 150 to 200 microns long. They have a complex and well-developed phagocytic pathway to take up and digest food bacteria as they swim through um, pond and lake waters. So here's the oral apparatus and then a forming food vacuole um, and then already formed food vacuoles with very interesting contents in them here. Um, and all ciliates, including paramecium, have two types of nuclei in each cell. Um, they have a germline micronucleus. Here is a paramecium tetraurelia cell um, with two micronuclei or germline nuclei uh, and one big somatic macronucleus, which is where all the gene expression of the cell happens. So they have divided, they've subfunctionalized these two functions of the nuclei into these two types of nuclei. And that's only important because of thinking about how our um, bacteria here infect the different nuclei, and I'll get to that. Um, so holospora, which are the bacteria that we study, so they're the bacterial partner in this host microbe interaction that I'll be talking about today. Um, so they infect the paramecium caudatum micronucleus. Um, so I'll be talking about just paramecium caudatum species today. And holospora are really cool. Um, I think objectively, <laughs> they are endonuclear, which means that they do not, they not only infect the cell inside of the cell, they infect the a nucleus of the cell. Um, they are obligate, which means that they can't, as far as we know, live outside of the paramecium host. Um, they're parasitic, so they harm the host in um, various ways. And you can be infected if you're a paramecium cell either by inheriting um, the holospora from your mom as, sh as she goes through vegetative fission, or you can take up infectious forms of the holospora in the course of filter feeding. Um, so in this image here, this is a live paramecium cell with a whole bunch of these medusa looking um, infectious forms of holospora undulata bacteria filling the micronucleus, which used to be micro, but now is macro. It's, I mean, not, it just looks macro, it's not actually macro. Um, it's much bigger and has been enlarged by the bacteria. And here's the actual macronucleus of the cell. Um, so a main point here is that many bacteria use similar strategies to holospora to get inside of and evade detection in host cells. So this has relevance thinking about this host, um, host parasite interaction and this um, host immunity, which is what I'll be talking about, um, has relevance across you know, across eukaryotic life. And so just a little bit of background so to kind of get us thinking about how this actually works, because I think this really trips people up sometimes. Um, so when you have the endpoint of an infection in a cell or even outside of a cell, it's the end result of specific interactions between a host and a pathogen or a symbiont, um, mutualistic symbiont. Um, a few cases in point that I just kind of um, jotted down. One, um, if you think about the receptors on the outside of cells that um, many pathogens interact with, both bacterial and viral. One example is the CCR5 receptors on the surface of human cells that are used as co-receptors by HIV in order to get into the cell. If you don't have, if you don't have a full CCR5 receptor, the HIV cannot get into your cell. And there are people with this mutation. Um, case in point two, if we're moving into the cell, um, there are bacteria that can break out of these host cell compartments, these digestive compartments, say in macrophages, um, in response to changes in pH and other changes in those compartments in order to um, maybe make their own particular um, either Legionella-containing vacuole or Salmonella-containing vacuole or Mycobacterial-containing vacuole. So what they're doing here is they're quickly responding to the host changes in the compartments um, in order to evade this endpoint, which they want to avoid, right? Because this would be breaking them down and, and um, you know, processing them through the immune system so they can be detected by the host cells. 
um, totally related to this, then you can have hijacking of, of membrane compartments, other compartments, so that you can mimic host trafficking proteins in order to convince the host cell, oh, this, no, this is just an endosome, this is not a lysosome, don't, don't chew me up, basically. Um, so these are all common themes in um, bacterial and viral um, host interactions. Um, lastly, um, that we can have recruitment of host actin across bacterial clades from that they can recruit the actin from the host cytoplasm to propel them across the cell so they can uh, basically co-opt the host um, actin in order to move across the cell. Um, and keep in mind that bacteria learned, we can think about the, at this evolutionary adapted adaptation process, learned how to get into these host cells originally by probably by infecting single-celled organisms. So we see this pattern again and again. And that's one of the reasons that it's fun to study um, an interaction like this because it has um, very direct like analogous and homologous um, relationship to our own cells and their infections. Okay, so how does this all relate directly to Holospora? So Holospora does a lot of these things. It must break out of the paramecium digestive compartment. So if it's taken up by the, um, the cytopharynx or the um, oral apparatus and it gets into this first compartment, if it does not escape immediately from the digestive vacuole after acidification, it will get digested. Um, so it needs to escape um, very quickly within minutes um, out of that rapidly acidifying vacuole. And so here's an image from my lab, a live cell with, um, this is difficult to catch this early in the process. So this is an actual Holospora infectious form inside of a host or a um, food vacuole. Um, Holospora infectious forms also make their way across the host cell by recruiting host actin from the cytoplasm. And this was shown um, um, over, you know, about a dozen years ago. And this, we're labeling green actin here being um, co-opted by the red holospora to move across the host paramecium cell. And so that's how they are able to you know, move to the nucleus, either nucleus. Holospora obtusa um, specifically infect the macronucleus and holospora undulata infect the micronucleus. And related to that, the holospora, these infectious forms then they must also be interacting with some unknown nucleus specific factors to be allowed into that nucleus of choice or not even choice, just nucleus of adaptation, right? Whichever one they've um, chosen to infect. Um, and so here is Holospora undulata um, in the micronucleus and it's beginning to septate and, um, and de-differentiate into a reproductive form. Um, and so also related, Holospora appears to remodel the host nucleus that it's in into a niche for itself, which it then will grow in and enlarge and then re-differentiate into. So, um, you know, these infectious forms are making their way into the nuclei or nucleus and they de-differentiate into reproductive forms, which are able to divide and fill the micronucleus here. So this is a fixed cell um, image made by one of my students. Um, and here's the macronucleus in the background of the caudium cell. This is a great image. And then um, here's a live cell showing them re-differentiating back into infectious forms in that um, micronucleus. And so the, it, in this process, the micronucleus is getting bigger and bigger um, to the point where if you put it under a slide like this, it can kind of explode and you can see infectious forms throughout the cell. So there are cues from the host that um, cause the reproductive forms that have divided um, and reproduced themselves to re-differentiate into infectious forms, probably things like starvation and, um, you know, the number of hosts that are in a, in a particular population. Um, eventually, they can be released from the nucleus and the cell if they're being transmitted horizontally. So what we're really interested in in my lab um, you know, as a, as a molecular biologist, an evolutionary cell biologist, I really want to know what the cellular factors are. What are the proteins and the genes that are involved with interacting with Holospora, in this case, Holospora undulata, 
as the infection proceeds. So what's allowing this to happen at, at these different stages? Um, so what I do know, and we've actually known this for quite a while, um, but this is what first kind of triggered me to think that this, this approach could work is that paramecium, different paramecium caudatum strains with different um, genetic backgrounds are differentially susceptible to Holospora undulata. So there is the, the difference is heritable. Um, and there, so there's some amount of genetic component. It's not the whole thing. It's obviously a G by E or genetic environmental interaction. And so we showed in a recent paper, um, a student of mine and I and others showed that in this Frontiers in Microbiology paper that these different strains, they have heritable differences in infection prevalence um, between the strains. And the strains can be quite closely related um, when determined by this single marker genotyping. So to me, this, tell, this tells me that there are genetic differences that allow them to be infected or not to varying degrees. So that, that is a sign that we can find them, however difficult it might be. Okay, so how did we decide to approach this? Um, first, we wanted to um, see what genes are up or down regulated across the genome in susceptible paramecium cells upon contact with the Holospora bacteria. And then we wanted to ask what genes um, perhaps of this set are functionally involved in infection. And I'm gonna tell you about each of these um, experiments that we've been doing. So first, um, this work was started at Indiana University with um, a student in the Lynch lab, uh, Catherine Kagaman, um, who's now a graduate student and at Cornell. And she um, kind of got into that, we got into this, we, we started a collaboration and um, obtained these lines with the, the Holospora infections. And so you know, she made this, diagram of the different stages based on what we observed and the previous literature. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, they break out of, they break out of the oral apparatus within 10 to 30 minutes. Within an hour, they're making their way across the cytoplasm to the micronucleus where they're in the micronucleus by 24 hours. Um, they're fairly easy to observe at this point because you can see that infectious form in the micronucleus. Then it gets difficult after a couple of days because the reproductive forms um, start to divide and they look a lot like that, the food bacteria that we feed to the cells too. So we got, we're, we've gotten pretty good over the years at identifying the, um, the two different kinds of bacteria. And then if the cells are starved or fed less food over a week, then they redifferentiate into the infectious forms. And then of course, remembering that this is an obligate interaction, we have to use these starved infection, infectious form producing cells to infect other cells. And so we needed to decide when to collect the RNA for this RNA sequencing experiment that we decided to do. Um, and so we decided to, whoops, choose um, early time points to begin with, because thinking that one, that early transcriptional response will determine the later infection status. So perhaps there are some, you know, hopefully master regulatory genes that might be triggering downstream processes. Um, and so then we, we collected RNA at 10 minutes and 30 minutes in order to do this. Um, keeping in mind that we'd like to look later too, but another aspect of this is that the, inter the cell culture gets pretty heterogeneous as you go later and later in this process, whereas early on it can be quite synchronized. If you add a big um, mess of infectious forms to begin with. Um, so here's our experimental design. Um, so what we did was we had two kinds of cells that we were using for the lysate so that we had a, um, a control set of naive cells. So these are cells that, have, that are not infected with Holospora. And then we have infected cells, highly infected cells with infectious forms. And so we're homogenizing these two different sets of cells in order to infect or quote unquote infect the other naive cells. And so our samples were um, naive cells that were uninfected that were then had either a lysate including the infectious forms used to inoculate them or this control uninfected lysate. And the uninfected lysate was used to control for this kind of you know, non-physiological non 
response or this process of being bathed in a light state of other cells, which isn't necessarily how they come in contact with infectious forms in the wild. Um, so we had um, 18 samples total. So we had, we looked at zero minutes. So before infection, 10 minutes and 30 minutes. And we had uh, biological replicates. So separate tubes of infections We had three biological replicates for each um, time point. And then of course we had the controls. Um, so the other nine tubes are the mock infected um, controls. And so we extracted the RNA, made cDNA libraries, and did Illumina sequencing at the sequencing center at Indiana University. And so um, just some stats, because I feel like that's part of the crowd here. <laughs> Um, so previous genome sequencing efforts of the paramecium caudatum genome indicated that there were 18,509 genes. Um, we found transcripts for um, 13,256 genes. Um, perhaps this reflects the fact that we're doing a, we were doing um, a smaller number of reads, or maybe it's just the different conditions or the different strain, because this is a different strain of paramecium caudatum. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested in thinking about that more. But so we did a sequencing run of 340 million reads. So that's about 18.9 um, million reads per sample. Um, and we had between 14 and 21 million reads in a given sample. Um, so we found, um, like I said, transcripts for about 13,000 genes. Um, and we also found transcripts that were not annotated in the previous reference genome, which is interesting. And I'll talk a little bit about those genes later. They might be genes that were not on in those vegetatively growing cells that we, um, that the Lynch lab sequenced in the past too. Okay, so here's just a, an example of our data. So we have expression levels at zero minutes um, and then expression levels at 30 minutes. And of course we're comparing them along the, the diagonal. And so genes that don't have um, a change in expression are going to fall along that diagonal. And so some of the genes that fall off of the diagonal will be um, significantly up or down regulated. And so um, that's how we filtered these out. And so what we found was out of these 13,256 genes, a significant minority of the genes were um, significantly differentially expressed at both early time points. Um, so we had a, a good overlap of differentially expressed genes or DGs at both time points, about a thousand. Um, whereas we had um, a lot more genes that turned up in the 10 minutes post inoculation time point as differentially expressed, so about 2000 or 1900, and then 453 genes at 30 minutes. Um, so basically about 26% of the total number of genes in any of our conditions were differentially expressed. Um, we found many more upregulated than downregulated, um, which I think is interesting. And you know, just from looking at the literature, this can be seen as a relatively small number or a large number. It really depends on your experimental design and the biology of your um, system, I guess. Um, so this, as a molecular biologist, I mean, I'm thinking about how to study each and every one of these genes. It's impossible. Um, this, so the, to me, this is still too many genes to do experiments on every single one. So we get to, we want to get to our, um, you know, low hanging fruit approach here. So um, in thinking about that, I'm going to be filtering those further. But first, in thinking about the whole genome, the, the whole data set, um, a larger percentage of these differentially expressed genes are annotated either functionally or structurally than in the genome as a whole. So 81% of these DEGs are annotated, quote unquote, you mean, meaning they have a structure or a function associated with them by homology. Um, and 74.5% of the genes in the genome as a whole are annotated. Um, and then I also wanted to look um, at orthology. So how many of these genes have um, related genes in other species? And again, totally consistent with the above, all significantly differential expression genes have more orthologs than other genes in the genome across life. So I looked across um, these different groups. So if we're going out in terms of relatedness, so here's paramecium tetraralia. Um, you can see that if we're comparing all caudatum genes in blue, 
to the 10 minute and 30 minute DEGs, the 10 and 30 minute DEGs always have more orthologs than in the genome as a whole. We can look at another ciliate, tetrahymena, another, yet another ciliate, oxytrica. Um, we can look at plasmodium, falciparum. We can look at um, chlamydomonas, giardia, humans, yeast, and E. coli. So kind of going across life here. And consistently across these groups, we, have, we see more orthologs. So our genes, the significantly differentiated expressed genes in this um, larger data set tend to be more, appear to be more conserved and have more orthologs across species. Okay, so like I said, I need to narrow these genes down because I can't study a thousand, we can't study a thousand genes at, my, at once as much as we would like to. And so in order to think about what genes are functionally involved in controlling infection, so what genes, if we, um, if we knock them down, knock them out or overexpress them, is it going to change the infection process? Um, we need to be able to screen a subset of genes. So what we did was further filter these genes into highly or greater than twofold differentially expressed sets. And that gave us a much smaller number. Um, so we have um, 98 genes that are differentially, highly differentially expressed at 10 minutes and 19 at 30 minutes and 34 at both time points. And this is the set that I'm going to be focusing on because that to me is a very manageable set. Some side notes, only 20 of this 219 total genes are downregulated. And those are certainly of interest, but I'm not gonna be focusing on them for our functional work yet. Um, only two of these genes in this overlapping, so that are highly differentially expressed at both time points are downregulated. So what do these genes look like? What do their expression patterns look like? Um, some of them are highly expressed and become even more highly expressed at 10 and 30 minutes. So these are the, we're just focusing on the, um, the, this set of 34 highly differentially expressed genes at both time points. So it's a very, our filtered set that is our super low hanging fruit here, or that's how I think of them at least. They can also be, um, you know, at some level of expression and turned up. They can also look like they're off or be essentially zero expression level at zero minutes and then, go, and then be turned on at 10 and 30 minutes. So to me, these are kind of two qualitatively different things um, going on here. So these are our genes. What do they do? What do we think they do? Um, so we're gonna focus on the 32 here that are upregulated. Um, interestingly, of this set of 32, fewer are annotated than the larger differentially expressed gene sets. So only 36% of these genes are annotated, which is a much smaller number than the larger set. Um, and we have some kinases, some transporters, um, a couple of trafficking related genes, a couple of pro protein binding genes, one DNA binding gene, um, another enzyme, and then these unknown function. So these are genes that have no known homologs or function predicted from any annotation. Um, and also these coiled coil domains. So we, we can kind of pull out a domain that is coiled coil, but we still don't know what it does or if it has any uh, anything that looks like it in another species. To me, I mean, these are really interesting genes, even though it's really hard to know what they do. But we now know that they are turned up or on in response to this um, infection or the stress process that comes with infection. Um, so what we're doing is we are looking at these in this unbiased way to try to um, figure out what their function might be. But it is difficult because we can't say, oh, it's definitely a kinase or it's definitely um, a transcription factor. We, we, don't, we can't say that based on homology. Um, so what we've been doing for the past year in my lab with my awesome team of undergrads is to knock down each of these individually um, genes and these genes individually in susceptible cells and see if that has an effect on infection. So what we're doing is we're taking a susceptible cell and we're trying to turn these, the expression of these genes down to see if that has, um, that also tamps down infection. Because remember that what we're thinking is that these genes might be allowing infection to proceed by interacting with um, the holosphere in some way, either directly or indirectly. 
So we started, we started cloning for this project almost exactly two years ago. And um, they, I had this awesome team start to clone these genes. So what we're doing, what they did was they took um, paramecium caudatum DNA from a particular strain and they cloned a short piece of the gene into a plasmid that will express this in a double stranded, into double stranded RNA in, in bacterial cells. So this is the same way we induce um, gene silencing in C. elegans and other organisms that you can induce gene silencing easily with feeding because we can do that in paramecium, which is great. Um, so they cloned each of these genes into this construct. Um, and here's some of the students that's, that did this, um, Winnie and Ryan and Caitlin. You can tell that this is pre-COVID, this picture, there's no masks. Um, and so they've been, they cloned these over the course of um, summer and of fall. So summer and fall 2019. And so now we have, we had a silencing construct for each gene. And so then what, what the students did was uh, they started inducing silencing four days before infection. So remember we need to, what we need to do is induce the production of these double-stranded RNAs in, from these plasmids in these special cells that, uh, the special E. coli cells that have their RNA snuffed out so that they will actually express these double-stranded RNAs. And then we feed these double-stranded RNA producing cells to paramecium, they break them down they detect the RNA, um, the double strand RNA, and then they induce their RNAi, you know, chewing up machinery that then will hopefully destroy the gene products of that gene. Um, so what we're doing there, the students were silencing this four days before infection in the hopes that this would produce that um, silencing by that point. And generally um, in the literature for paramecium tetraralia, uh, this works with two days of feeding. Permesium caudatum grow a little slower, so we gave them four days. Um, no one has published uh, paramecium caudatum gene silencing yet. I know we know that there are other people working on this, and they, um, you know, they, we've been talking to them, but I haven't talked to them recently, but it appears to work, so that's good news. Um, these hopefully silenced cells that we are also. Um, collecting RNA from to make sure they are silenced, but they um, they were then infected with Holospora undulata, and then the infection phenotype was determined 14 to 15 days later. So we scored for infection prevalence 14 to 15 days later. Um, and so all of this induction and silencing was a, a huge coordinated project that the students jumped right into and um, scheduled, and basically every weekend of this year there were people feeding and and counting cells. And so it's been pretty awesome to see. Um, and a lot of these students graduated this year. So here's um, Emily and Ryan, and Ryan graduated this year. And obviously this is post or during COVID. Um, so we infected uh, both knockdown and control cells with Holospora and looked at infection prevalence, as I mentioned, at 14 to 15 days um, post inoculation. So, um, Jared, who graduated this year, kind of helmed this project with the help of a lot of other people too. And um, very similar to the way that we infected for the RNA sequencing project, we're making a lysate of these cells and bathing the naive cells with this lysate. And importantly, the naive cells here are the same strain that we did the cloning in, so they have the match of the double strand RNA. Okay, and so here's his workflow. Okay, and we also did positive controls because like I said, we hadn't done gene knockdowns or this gene silencing in paramecium caudatum before. So we wanted to do positive controls to see if we could actually get it to work. Um, and so we chose some genes that had been used in other ciliates, including um, IFT80, which is the, cilia, the ciliary um, in gene. And it's been shown that when it's knocked down, it makes the cells more bald. Um, you may not be able to see that here, but it does. It is missing some cilia. It does have some cilia too. Here's a control cell with a full set of cilia. Um, and then we also did MOB1, which is um, it's a spindle positioning gene that when it's knocked down or knocked out, as has been shown in Stentor and Tetrahymena, but not Paramecium yet. 
um, that it induces a patterning defect. That means that the cells, instead of dividing um, you know, straight in half, they have a weird spindle position and they end up making these weird monstery cells. Um, so Jared started imaging these this spring and this, we didn't see super monster cells, but we're actually working on this this summer, my student and I, um, and we're seeing a lot more monstery cells now. So um, these percent abnormal cells is, is, we're working the protocol out so that it becomes more um, effect, effective basically. Um, and then um, we also had Ryan coming in and developing the qPCR assay to detect whether these were actually knocked down. And you can see here that, um, and hopefully from what I'm telling you, we can induce knockdown, but it is, um, it's, it's a heterogeneous response. So you can see here that we'll, um, we have, you know, we have a lot of variation in what the cells look like, depending on the culture that is being knocked down. And we also see a lot of variation in the relative gene expression. And so this is pretty common with knockdowns in paramecium, at least in my experience. Um, and so you have to you have to kind of look across different cultures to see different knockdown effects. And so we'll be we're working on that this summer to do that. Um, so that keeping in mind that this is a heterogeneous process, it's not a knockout, right? We're not knocking out the gene in every cell. We're knocking it down, and we're knocking it down to varying levels in the different cells and cultures. So this very heterogeneous process, and we're also um, bombarding it with this heterogeneous um, assay. So um, here is the, so these are the results of all the infection trials. Probably what stands out is that there are a lot of different um, infection prevalences. Um, so what, what we did over the whole year was run 14 infection trials of these knockdown cells. Um, we also did for every trial, we did a negative control with the empty vector with no double-stranded RNA being produced. And those are all the red samples. And each one of these boxes represents a trial. And you can, hopefully you can see from, or not hopefully, but you can see from looking at this that the red controls can vary quite a lot too, right? And that's something that we see when we infect normally. So that is a normal heterogeneous response to infection. Um, and then of course, with the knockdowns, which are all the other colors, we, look, we did knockdowns of 29 of those 32 genes. Um, and each gene was represented by at least three biological replica experiments. So three tubes of infection. And you can see those three dots for each gene. Um, so this heterogeneous response with this heterogeneous um, knockdown, we're going to get a lot of heterogeneity. Um, but interestingly, we did do um, statistical analysis to look for statistically significant differences. Um, and so in this first pass of 29 genes, we found that there were five that were, appeared to be statistically significant. So we totally just took those and repeated the experiment to see if they would stay statistically significant if we had a larger sample size. And so here are those five genes here. Um, and so we've got two coiled coil um, genes here um, and two annotated genes and then an unknown gene. And so when we repeated these trials, so we've got the first set of trials on the left and the second set on the right, um, three out of the five repeated experiments yielded continued statistical significance. Um, so the CC5 and more knockdowns appear to have the greatest phenotypic effects. You can kind of see that here, right, with your eyes. Um, and TVP15 also had significantly lower infection rates, and we did a lot of these samples. And the UK10 and CC2 had variability between the trials that affected the statistical significance, and I don't have the other UK10 here. So, um, you know, this is our screen from the past year. This is what we're, you know, getting out of it. The goal here is to find these genes that we think are functionally involved in this process and to follow up on them, right, always. Um, so what do these genes actually do? So MORN uh, stands for Membrane Occupation and Recognition Nexus, um, was originally assumed to be lipid binding molecules, so associated with membranes and cells that modulated membrane targeting. It looks like they may actually be involved in homomeric protein interactions 
um, of dimers and other oligom oligomers. So they're involved in bringing proteins together, probably for signaling or trafficking reasons. Um, so that's consistent with a role in this kind of um, trafficking or signaling that might be going on here. Um, TVP TVP15 is also a trafficking protein. It's associated with the Golgi apparatus, and it, it has been shown to be deployed in response to stress. So maybe it's a stress responsive gene that may be involved with some uh, process of in specific to infection as well. Um, and then lastly, of course, CC stands for coiled coil. So it just contains at least one coiled coil domain. We don't know what the function is yet. That will be fun to follow up on. It's also on the larger size for these um, kind of unknown proteins, it's 59 kilodaltons. These um, unknown proteins tend to be shorter than the other ones, perhaps consistent with them being um, maybe newer or faster evolving genes. Um, so in, as we go forward, what are we going to do? You can probably tell what we're gonna do. We're um, going to validate these knockdowns, you know, the, especially the ones with phenotypic effects as well as the ones without phenotypic effects, of course. Um, through with qPCR just of samples to see um, that they are actually knocked down when we see a phenotypic effect. And we're this summer we're working on continuing to improve this knockdown efficiency by um, manipulating the protocol. And so we're using these positive control genes, the MOB1 and IFT80 um, positive controls. Um, and then as we move forward, we'll follow up with these promising candidates and probably tag them and track them in cells over infection and find out what they bind. I'm also interested in those proteins. I'm still interested in those um, genes that appear to be turned on in response to the bacterium. So they could, because they might be um, indicators for infection that we can use in the future to track, um, you know, the beginning of the infection process in the host. So they might be good marker um, genes. Um, and then we'll continue with the other side of this, which is to do RNA sequencing of susceptible and resistant strains to try to figure out which, uh, molecular determinants, determinants are involved in resistance. So I just talked a whole bunch about determinants involved in infection, but let's think about what might be involved in the resistance to this um, bacterium. Um, and then we'll, we'll do more evolutionary analysis of these genes as well. I kind of hinted at that in the last slide too. And I think I'm keeping on time pretty well. So I'm just gonna end here with an acknowledgement. I've been telling you um, as I've gone through the students that have been doing this work, but this has also been done in collaboration with um, Oliver Kaltz at the University of Montpelier in France, um, and Jeff Gu, who did a lot of the uh, initial RNA sequencing analysis when I didn't really know what I was doing um, with the first pass of this project. And then Sasha, who provided a lot of the strains that we've used um, and a lot of the genetic analysis of the different strains. Um, and then of course, Tom and Pruel, my colleagues from the Lynch Lab, and you guys know Tom, um, and then my and then Mike Lynch, my my former boss from IU, um, and we're I've been supported by NSF both through the Lynch Lab, but also through this Research Opportunity Award that I used to go um, do a sabbatical doing this, um, and then my on-campus organizations, and then of course um, NC Gas. So I'll end there. Thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions. Cool, that was terrific, Lydia. Um, I wanted to mention one or two things. Um, one, um, uh, Sherry will produce a blog that goes over some of the um, technical details of, of what Lydia's done. So if you're interested in thinking more about how to do it yourself, um, that will be coming out shortly. And also um, in July, um, we have a transcriptome assembly and analysis uh, workshop. Um, <clears throat> it's one we've run for quite a while. Um, but this year we'll be using Lydia's data set in that course. Um, and in addition to what she's done, we'll um, do de novo assembly of her RNA set and then see if that changes the results any at all. It may sharpen them up, it, who's to say. So um, it if you liked what this sounded like, I mean, what this work sounded like, um, you will have a chance to work with the real data yourself if you sign up for the course. Yeah, and I didn't mention that in the, um, the technical details, but yeah, I did this by mapping to the reference genome for these transcripts. So we can do the same thing, but um, data transcriptome 
we do de novo assembled and then map um, all the reads to that. Nice. Yeah. And I'm really excited to see what you guys find and how it intersects with this data and how I can make this data set more, make more sense. <laughs> Hopefully. And also just to add um, our workshop this time, um, if you've heard about it before, if you've been around with NCGAS for a while, it's previously been solely focused on DeNovo, but because of this super awesome data set that Lydia was able to share with us, um, we do actually have code and coverage in that um, workshop for both genome guided and DeNovo. So if you're doing any of that kind of work, um, this would be a good a uh, chance to try out all these methods, including clustering and annotation and um, differential expression to kind of follow along and uh, learn how to perform these kind of analyses yourself. <laughs>